Today will be about uh, synergizing model and human decision making using augmented machine learning, which is quite a long title, but it's about how we collaborate, how models and humans collaborate at uh, Florijn to do decision making. And it turns out that we're not the only one doing this. Uh, JP Morgan bankers learn to work with expanding AI team. This was in the news last week. And what triggers me a lot about this, this headline is with the expanding AI team. Bankers are not replaced by machine learning, but they learn, uh, yeah, they learn to work with AI to improve their decision making. So the head of the AI team also said, bankers were initially skeptical of the product because they didn't understand its reasoning. Uh, but once they were provided with the explanation, the proportion of bankers agreeing with the AI's recommendations rose from 65 to 95%. And we're doing something similar at Florijn, and I will talk you through that during this presentation. So about me, I'm a data scientist at Florijn for two years now. I have a background in industrial engineering, uh, but I also studied uh, data science. And I like to solve stuff pragmatically, which you will also see in this presentation, uh, of course. <coughs> then about, the f about Florijn, the company I work for, my squad is also here in the second row. Um, we're an uh, SME lending platform, so we provide flexible credit limits to companies. Um, there are no annual reports required with us, so you don't have to hand in uh, your entire accounting history, but uh, you can just provide us with bank statements from the last six months. We'll do a risk assessment based on that, and uh, then we can provide you with a loan pretty fast compared to a bank. We can do it within 24 hours usually, but our fastest conversion is, uh, is four. So if you compare that to the typical bank loan, then we're super fast. Um, yeah, then long, one last note here is that lending money is super easy. If you have an IBAN number, I can transfer you money. The trick is really to get it back. And that's what uh, our business is all about, of course. Then to introduce, I uh, gave him a name. Our gatekeeper is called uh, Patrick. He works for the risk team and he's really responsible for lending out the money. Um, he monitors our por portfolio as well. And of course, like everyone working in the banking world, the finance world, he loves to use Excel. And yeah, Patrick is our main objective during this presentation and he will come back. This is, yes, next slide. Uh, this is our sign up flow. Pretty simple, uh, you sign up with your company, you supply us with some bank statements from the last six months. Patrick will review your um, application and he makes a decision. So yes, you're approved, you will get the money from us uh, and no, you're rejected. He won't get any money from us. You can go to a competitor or try it with the bank. But uh, yeah, Patrick is really our gatekeeper. He decides on who gets the money and who doesn't. Um, yeah, then what do we use for that? I already mentioned bank statements, of course, so uh, you can connect your typical bank like ABN AMRO, ING, Rabobank. Uh, we have PSD2 support as well, so it's like an API that you connect and you can read your bank statements directly. But we also use some third party data, so uh, Google, and we also get your KVK number so we can get where your company is based, uh, how many employees you have. Uh, but of course, our main source of data is transactional data. Um, you can see some examples here. I'm not sure if it's readable, but the first one says uh, a transaction from the tax authorities on a certain date um, with a certain IBAN. The second one is from no, an individual, Jay Smith, also on a certain date, and it also contains a description. And based on these, um, yeah, based on these features, we decide uh, on a label. So for example, the first one is from the tax authorities, and we give it the label tax. But the second one contains the word salary in a description, so we mark it as a salary payment. Uh, yeah, and of course we aggregate all of this. This goes to our credit intelligence engine. And uh, yeah, we, we can get all kinds of insights based on yeah, this raw data at the beginning. And we don't only use it for our risk underwriters like Patrick, but we also use it for our models, of course. 
yeah, then some to give some examples on the features that we then calculate that we can calculate from the transactional data that we then label ourselves, uh, monthly revenues, if you have any payment problems, because we recognize those as well. If you, if you pay salary, do you pay enough salary tax over that? How many debtors do you actually have? Do you have other financing parties? Can you go, uh, can you get a negative balance at the bank? Those are all things that we can calculate and that we also use for the models, but also provide to our humans like Patrick. But we want to work with Patrick because we want to make his work more efficient. Uh, you know, we want to make the work of the risk team more efficient without scaling the team. Um, so why do we want to do that? Yeah, we want to point Patrick in the right direction. If we can make, if we can summarize why a client is good or bad, um, he can make a faster decision. He knows where to look for. Uh, and then we have happier clients because they get their money sooner um, and we're super customer friendly. So this is why we would want to do that. Uh, yes. Now you would say you can predict the default uh, to predict this. Uh, so uh, a bankruptcy or they cannot um, pay us back anymore. But actually defaults take a lot of time to develop, of course. They have to be your customer for a pretty long time before uh, a default is there. And our volume is actually pretty low for defaults. So it's actually hard to predict the default for experimenting with that now, but that's not what my talk will be about. It's about predicting this. So we try to predict what Patrick would do for a certain decision. So you sign up with your company, Patrick makes a decision, but can we predict what Patrick would do to uh, point him in the right direction to see if, um, if he can make faster decision making based on his old decision making. And uh, this sounds a bit weird because you can also say, well, you can just ask Patrick, what is, he, what is he looking at? What features is he looking at? What is good? What is bad? But it turns out perfect clients go to the bank because at the bank you can get lower rates and higher loans it takes a bit longer, but if you're a sophisticated company, uh, it's doable at the bank. And you can compare this with, for example, a really nice car. Everyone can see that this is a nice car. Um, but what about this one? The exterior looks pretty nice. It's also a Mercedes. But if I open up the hood, I'm not a car expert. I don't know what to, li what to listen for, uh, how it drives, how it shifts. I'm not an expert in this. A mechanic is so Patrick is like our mechanic and he knows what to listen for where to look for so it's not that easy that you can really define rules what to look for whether a client is good or bad it's really a gut feeling um, that we want to model so we want to model Patrick we want to model Patrick's gut feeling to make a decision faster So the processes I will cover today, it's our sign-up flow, which I just introduced, but also our review flow, which will come after. If, uh, if someone is already our client, then we review them uh, regularly. And that is also a process we uh, uh, apply machine learning to. So starting with the sign-up. So how this once started was that we had a sign-up, then there was a model afterwards that made a decision uh, and we would soft approve them, so give a recommendation to approve to Patrick or reject them. But Patrick didn't really uh, like this. He didn't understand, just like the JP Morgan uh, use case, the example. Uh, the problems were, well, it came down to this. Uh, what features are actually used in your model? Uh, what are their values? And how did it actually come to this prediction? Because you're giving me a recommendation now to well, reject someone or to approve someone, but where is this coming from? Can you explain why? So we want to get Patrick on board. And I will now introduce you five ways and how, you, how we got Patrick on board, but how you can do this as well for your use cases to get your stakeholders to trust the machine learning uh, models. And this resulted in an improved collaboration with Patrick, more performant models, of course, but also a way to get continuous feedback from our stakeholders to continuously improve on. 
Uh, so we learned from our mistakes and we also gained some dom domain knowledge along the way. So we became a sort of a car mechanic as well. We know what to listen for and how to model features and uh, how to take all of this into account. So the first, uh, the first way of introducing transparency is by showing the features. Um, when we calculate uh, the, the features, all the raw transactions go into our model. It does all the aggregation there um, and it only gives out the prediction. But we can also return what is actually going, what we calculate, what is going in. Um, how do we calculate that feature? What is the description of that feature? What is its value? Uh, and how important is it for the decision? Um, and this is really, um, how do you say that, benefiting the entire process because Patrick also has features, but those are in Excel and he wants to see if the features that are in his Excel sheet are actually the same as that we calculate, and if it actually makes some sense. So this is a first way of introducing some transparency. Um, quite straightforward, you can do this as well. Return your features, show them in your platform. We build our own platform, so for us it's pretty convenient, but uh, yeah, you, everyone can show this in their dashboard. A second one is of course shop. Who's familiar with shop? And who uses it in production as well? Who shows it to his stakeholders? A few, okay, that's good. Uh, quick introduction to shop. Uh, explain feature contributions of models. So you can explain uh, how important is a feature, you can get this from that, but also uh, what is the relationship? What is the linear relationship between one of the features and the, out, uh, the outcome of the model? So how does it, um, you can see here that high feature values have a more red color and on the x-axis you can see the shop value, so the impact on the model output. Um, yeah, so it explains feature contributions of models. It's commonly used for uh, debugging your, uh, your machine learning models. Uh, you can do this for a single prediction, you can show this for a single prediction, or you can see the overall uh, shop values for all of your features. But it turns out that this is extremely useful to, so to show to your stakeholders with every prediction. Oh. This is a bit how it works. If you average all your features out and then apply one of your features, you can see the new expected outcome of your model. So for example, uh, in our use case, if you have a bakery and you apply at us but you, and you don't have a tax deficit, for example, then uh, your uh, probability to be approved is increasing a bit. Then also if you have uh, uh, continuously a positive balance in your bank account, then that is also positively increasing. But if you don't have your bakery for, uh, for a long time, for, for example, only a year, uh, then it decreases a little. So this is how these plots uh, work. Click here, something. yes. Then how a value is calculated. If you have something linear, I will not go into the more interactive models, but for linear models, it's quite straightforward. If you have your partial dependence plot, where you have on the y-axis the expected value of f of x, uh, while you apply the feature, so everything is averaged out, you only apply that one feature, then the shop value is actually calculated by uh, the average expected uh, uh, expected outcome compared to the um, if you apply the feature. So that the red part is actually your shop value and this is how all these, uh, uh, these plots work and how they, they show the values. If you have more complicated models with uh, interaction effects like boosting, then the work of Floyd Shopley really comes in with game theory, but um, I will not go into that. Uh, I have some resources on the next slide if you are interested in that. How this works in practice is that we show this to our stakeholders, to Patrick, um, for every decision that he is making to see if it actually makes sense for him. Um, so for example, you can see for this one that this company doesn't have VAT transactions, tax VAT transactions. And his days that his balance is sufficient is only about half of the time. And this already gives Patrick a uh, indication on where he needs to look at. If it turns out that we made a label mistake here, here but there, there are tax VAT transactions, 
then he can al already cross this out and the probability to be approved is higher. But he can also validate the green parts that contribute to the approval of the, of the customer uh, and validate that and do a faster decision making. If you want to know more about SHOP, uh, Scott Lundborg actually uh, did a lot in this field. He also made the SHOP Python package and uh, you can actually also use it for NLP and image classification. So if you have those use cases, then you can use it for that as well. Then we also have challenges. We want to continuously learn from our stakeholders. We model their behavior. So to, to uh, improve on that modeling, we introduce challenges and those work like this. We want to gather feedback. Patrick's decisions are all saved in our application and all decisions are then compared to his gut. So if he's not consistent because we trained a model on his decision making, then we know uh, how that works is like this. So there's a sign up, Patrick makes a decision, he decides to reject someone, uh, but the model also makes a decision, he, the model decides to approve someone, and then we create a challenge. So how this works is that um, Patrick is confronted with this screen, it's already filled in, but when, when he fills out the credit application and he decides to reject someone, reject the company, then everything is blocked for him. And he has to bring in a colleague to validate if his decision making is actually correct. They both look at the shop plot and then give, provide us with some feedback so that we can include new features, change our decision making in the model, uh, maybe try a different model or you know, change our entire modeling approach. So in this use case, you can see it says client already makes use of a Rabobank factoring product. There's no room to add extra financing. Turns out it was not in the shop plot that the company already had financing. So we should do a better job there. And it, yeah, this really fueled our uh, uh, feedback pipeline. Yeah, so how, how this helps is that shop is used to explain the model in the challenge. Uh, so Patrick looks at it, his colleague looks at it, and we save that information and we show it in our dashboard. So we. Yeah, we, do, we don't have to do anything to gather feedback. We don't have to walk to their desk. We still do, of course, but uh, we can just look at the dashboard and find new ways to improve the model, uh, to uh, improve our decision-making with the model. Then there's also monotone constraints that we're currently experimenting with. Uh, for example, there are a few features that always contribute to the approval or always negatively impact the decision. For example, if you have more revenue with your company, then the uh, probability to be approved is of course a lot bigger. Um, but also if you have a, a balance that is good over time, then that also contributes well. But if you have a tax delay, then it's not. And if you have other financing parties as well, then it's also not. But how can you explicitly tell your model you can do so with uh, monotone constraints. You can see an example if you compare the top plot with the bottom plot is that the top plot goes a bit up and down and it's, uh, it doesn't always, like if the feature value gets bigger, it doesn't always also uh, contribute more to the approval, for example. Uh, but in uh, yeah, this example came from XGBoost, you can really tell your model to and that uh, an increasing feature always contributes to the approval or always negatively impacts the decision. So uh, yeah, especially in FinTech, if you want to explain how things work, how features contribute, and you really want to be explicit and tell your model, this is perfectly possible. Yeah, and then now, of course, uh, this is rather short, but we do a lot of monitoring as well. Every decision is monitored, every challenge is monitored, everything our risk employees, like Patrick do, is also monitored. We compare it to our decision making, and this way we really uh, yeah, fuel our feedback loop, but also um, they can see it as well. So if they see uh, a lot of, lots of mistakes by the model, they can uh, tell us as well and uh, provide us with feedback, and uh, this is going really well. Then there's another process. 
which is the review process. Once they are in our system, we have to make sure that they are still financially healthy because yeah, they still need to pay us money, of course. So we need to monitor this a little. It can be a lot easier model. Uh, it has, doesn't have to be that complicated. Uh, so this is our review flow. Uh, when you're in our system, you will get a review every one, two or three months. You supply us with your bank statement. Patrick will make, uh, makes decisions again. If, some, if a client is good, then he gets the new review again in one, two or three months. But if it's bad, then there's an action. We might kick them out or we lower their credit limit. So the objective here is to really reduce the manual workload uh, for reviews because this is quite big for us, but without scaling the team. So a semi-automated review flow where we uh, predict if a review needs to be reviewed manually. If it needs to be reviewed manually, then it goes to Patrick. But if it's not required to review it manually, then it's of course good and we wait another one, two or three months and go in this loop again. Well, this resulted in a 60% reduction in the manual work. Uh, we spotted problems faster and we do manual work more efficiently again. Uh, and it's what turned out to be an easy to tune system. So how do we do that? Using a warning system that contained uh, business rules. So a bit easier than the first uh, model, uh, but this was even more easy to understand for stakeholders. It's easy to pinpoint the problem fast uh, and it's simple to adjust and tune. So it really works like a traffic light uh, with the business rules. But where do you start? A business rule system is quite nice, but where do you start defining the business rules? Well, you talk to Patrick, of course. Uh, what rules? Wh what are you looking at? What is then a good value for you? What is a bad value for you? And then you can also uh, test their assumptions. Uh, you can see if, if they made uh, if they did any actions based on what he's telling you, you can really fuel this with data and also tell him no if he's not right about certain um, rules and certain values and you can reflect together. Um, but what, what if you actually want to make this a bit more statistically, these rules? Where, what, he gives you some features, but where, where do you draw the thresholds? Um, we use data mining using trees for this, which is uh, actually uh, uh, a way that my colleague came up with to do this, to define business rules. So we train trees uh, and we train trees per feature with a depth of one. Uh, so if you have pre-processed input features, here we see four, um, we train a tree per feature. So uh, we this results in four trees that Every tree decides if something is good or bad for the in, in the end decision, if a review is good or bad. Uh, so how does a tree look like? Well, for example, you have the revenue that they're making divided by the loan that we provide them with. And if that's bigger than 0 0.7, then that's a good thing. But if it's uh, below 0 0.7, then that's bad. And the tree comes up with this himself, of course. And this is then something again that you can bring back to Patrick saying, well, statistically, this is the best cutoff for this feature to decide if uh, a client or a review is good or bad. What do you think? Oh, and then of course you can combine the trees. So you find an optimal combination of trees and it turns out that uh, tree two or four uh, make the best decisions here combined. So how does this combined decision making then work? Well, you can get a manual example. You can also tune this, of course. For example, you need uh, two bats before it's really bad. But for this case, if there's one bat, then it's bad, and you should go to the um, it should go to the manual process. It should go to Patrick. So we have feature one, which says it's good, but then feature two says it's bad, and then oh, well, it's bad, so it goes to Patrick, and then Patrick knows right away. Oh, I should look into feature two because that if that one is giving me a red signal. If it turns out to be okay, then he's, then he's um, way quicker in his decision making. And then there's also the automatic example, of course. 
Um, if both tree says it's good, then it's good, and it, you wait another one, two, or three months to, uh, to go back in the process. This is then how it looks like in our, uh, in our own system. You can see uh, it goes chronological from down to up. So uh, for review three, everything was okay. Uh, the green ones are activated, so those are active rules. The gray ones are, you can still see the values, but they are not, uh, they are not uh, contributing to the decision. And you can see in the timeline here that he's making a bit less money. The revenue is all the way to the left, but he started to uh, get some payment problems. So that's the, the red one here. So he, he, out of nowhere, he got two payment problems and he also built on some tax delay you can see here as well. So that is really to some, something to look into then. And then Patrick does this uh, manual decision making. He looks into the payment problems. He starts to look at the transactions which requires lots of context, which models cannot really uh, gasp, of course. So um, yeah, Patrick only looks at that one. And then he can also see the revenue, of course, but it turns out that this is not a problem. But it, yeah, it really sped up the entire process. Yes. Uh, this also turns out to be super easy to maintain. Uh, we train these trees, uh, it's a bit of a scikit-learn wrapper, but out of it comes a configuration file. We can easily adjust the configuration file, uh, yeah, because the rules are super, super simple to adjust. When something changes in our business process, for example, uh, construction companies are having a hard time and we should be more strict, then it's super easy to adjust this configuration file and it's pretty hard to actually tell a model and retrain and stuff. And it's also easy to monitor every rule. So we can see for our entire portfolio um, who is having payment problems, who has a decreasing revenue, who is not paying his taxes. So we use all of this, this in our monitoring as well to get like an entire overview. Well, looking ahead, could we increase the performance of this super simple model? Uh, yes, you can actually check it out in our blog, which is florine.tech. Um, so that's that. Uh, <laughs> concluding, Patrick is on board. Uh, models are super understandable. Uh, the review work is reduced significantly. Um, and he gives us valuable feedback, which is, I think, the most important thing. And as the data team, we gain the domain knowledge using this entire uh, process, which is the, the biggest thing that you can do as a data scientist is to gain domain knowledge to understand what the stakeholders are doing. There's also a lot of other cool stuff we work on. NLP to predict transaction labels. Uh, we also predict loan amounts and interest rates. Now we invest time in ML ops and you can join us. <laughs> We're looking for a machine learning engineer, a data science graduate student, a full stack software engineer and a data analyst. And uh, if you want to contact me, you can reach me on uh, one of those. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Kay. Um, I wonder how do ab abrupt economic changes in the uh, in the country affect your prediction of your model? Yeah. Just like, yeah, for example, uh, at some point in time, Corona came and. Yeah. No, that's an excellent question. Yeah, last year um, the government decided you don't have to pay tax anymore. Yeah. You still have to pay tax, but it's like delayed, and then tax turned out to be a super important feature for one of our models. If you pay your taxes, you're probably financial, financially healthy. And yeah, well, no company was paying tax anymore. <laughs> and then we rejected all the companies. Uh, so in the end, we uh, decided to uh, just remove the feature from the model. But of course, yeah, this is very hard. With the second one, it's easier to adjust. But like with the first one, it's, uh, it's hard. We decided to turn it off and base it on other features, which turned out pretty well. But so you have to flexibly put it where, yeah. where it needs. You can do that. Uh, yeah, of course you have. Don't you don't have any training data? Yeah. So that makes it super hard. <laughs> yeah, but it's on several features. Right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay, thank you.
thanks for the presentation. I've got a question about this uh, review process. Uh, you mentioned that you sometimes change the business rules, right? Yeah. When you, for example, know that construction companies have some struggles. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you know that certain um, areas of business are uh, in the turmoil right now? Yeah, that's, that really comes from our stakeholders again. So that's uh, Patrick again. <laughs> Uh, our uh, risk underwriters, uh, they, they really follow the news and they also look at, uh, like for example, these, um, we have lot, yeah, the price of materials of all is also going up right now and that is so really something that they feed to the company. Like we should watch this and that is then something we can take into account. And the new default goes up and um, your class is defaulting. Yeah, now uh, while we, uh, we are experimenting with that to actually predict defaults, uh, we don't have a lot, so that's also hard, of course. But uh, uh, yeah, we're experimenting with that. But uh, yeah, our current prediction models for the sign up is really predicting the underwriter's decision. But it's coming up. So it was cool to see that you were using like monotonic features, right? So put a little bit of domain knowledge extra in there. But then I started wondering, well, I mean, technically, if someone's asking for like a $100,000 loan, but they accidentally turn that into a $10 billion loan because they had a typo or something, yeah. then you could say, well, hang on, that's not monotonic. We should, oh. But then again, that's also an outlier, I started wondering. Yeah. Uh, do you do anything with outliers in that sense? Because I imagine outliers are more of a risk when you're doing monotonic stuff as well. Uh, yeah, so it's really something that we don't do in production right now, but it's that we're experimenting with. But of course, it's also capped. Uh, the, the max loan is really as a constant in our uh, code base, of course. It's and also the other features, right? Yeah. Yeah, of course, the, there's also human input. So, for example, how much do you think you will make this year? And how much do you think uh, you need from us? And we see quite some outliers in there. That's true. <laughs> Like people making way less than they say they are. And then, yeah, well, it's, uh, it's not contributing a lot. Uh, it's also not in the shop plots because it's just not really important because there's so much noise in there. When you guys take the time, you can do it. Ah, okay, thank you. Um, I would like to, if you can explain a bit more detail on the configuration file and translating to the rules and monitoring the rules and how exactly that happened. Yeah. Let's see. Yeah, so this is, uh, we wrap this in a yeah, scikit-learn model, actually. Uh, so every tree is just, is trained and is saved in this giant model, actually, that uh, uh, contains all the other models. Um, and from there, we get the thresholds just from the scikit-learn decision tree. You can find, because it's only one depth, you can find the threshold where it's splitting it. And where it splits it, we, yeah, we get that out and put it in a JSON file and then uh, feed it to our API. And then our API returns, uh, the features come in, it returns whether a feature is good or is bad. And we feed that back into our uh, main application uh, which we also built ourselves and then we show it uh, using the timeline so it says per feature if it's good or bad and then we give it a color and show it uh, so that's how we deploy uh, that stuff 